Imagine a magical world controlled by a false ruler. She has cursed the land to always be winter. Your best friend is turned to stone and holidays are never celebrated. Imagine all of this is at the hands of a witch. What would you expect her to look like? Would you imagine someone so cold and callous as a beautiful ice queen? I can tell you that the concept artists for this movie, where all of this happens, definitely didn't. Jadis the White Witch has one of my favorite looks for a villain. She's evil, but she's beautiful. It wasn't until I watched The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe recently that I realized these aren't just cool looking dresses, which is definitely what I thought when I was a kid. There's a subtle story they all tell about her wicked personality, her unconventional heritage, and her ultimate demise. And when I researched the design process, I thought it was so interesting how her overall concept wasn't even as obvious as it seems now. By the time the Pevensey children enter Narnia, Jadis has forcefully ruled for a hundred years. Though she isn't the rightful queen, she maintains power through her winter enchantments. Most Narnians are terrified of her. Those against her are punished and turned to stone. Those loyal to her act as spies. Though Jadis is strong, she lives in fear. A prophecy states that four human children, two boys and two girls, will cause her downfall. So she orders that if any humans are found in Narnia, they are to be turned over to her to be killed. Held. According to the costume designer Isis Musidin, apologies for any mispronunciations, the White Witch was the most challenging character to design for. There had been almost 100 concept art images, but the director, Andrew Adamson, wasn't pleased with any of them. These designs depicted a conventional evil witch with dark hair, black dresses, and cold steel armor. There are also illustrations in the Chronicles of Narnia books written by C.S. Lewis, which these movies are based on but they are generic depictions of a queen figure and not detailed. Isis had to build the witch's look from scratch. With the help of the production designer, she came up with the ice concept. This might seem so obvious now, but this is quite a unique take on the witch. Her costuming is different from traditional evil witches like the evil queen in Snow White or the Wicked Witch of the West. Even in the 1988 TV adaptation of this book, she has a much eviler design. In this version, Jadis is not darkly dressed even though she still has a dark personality. It's Tilda Swinton who plays Jadis, who brings the ugly evilness to an otherwise beautiful dress. But before we delve deeper into that aspect, I want to talk about the intricate and practical details behind the construction of these dresses. Jadis isn't human, so her clothes are fantastical. They don't look man-made. This is achieved through several elements. The ice dresses are not meant to be different dresses, but rather the same dress that magically shifts. The dress is an extension of herself and changes depending on her circumstance. The evolution concept was actually inspired by Pokemon. The costume designer's son was obsessed with the franchise and she felt that Jadis could evolve the way Pokemon do to reflect her power levels. Isis didn't like to think that the witch had a closet. Her dress is something that she manifests. In the overall design of these dresses, there are no touches of human dressmaking. There are no visible seams, no zippers. The fabric, which is one of my favorite parts, was custom made in-house to ensure that it looked otherworldly and not manufactured. The first layer is dyed velvet, the second layer is felted wool and silk, and the final layer is lace. The lace is built from a pretty complex process of metallic thread and organza shaped into an ice crackle design. This was all hand sewn to the fabric. The fantasy aesthetic also comes through with references to natural elements. The dress looks like water, smoke, and ice. Her fur is from animals, her hair resembles tree roots, and her crown is made of icicles. If you haven't read the books, you might not know that Jade is actually not from Narnia. She used to rule the city of Charn, which is actually found in a completely separate dimension. The royal blood in that city is known to be half giant. To give the illusion of height, the lace pattern is large on the bottom of the skirt and gets smaller towards the bodice. Tilda Swinton also wore massive platform boots. Both features give her a looming powerful presence, especially as she towers over Edmund. These fantasy details are so subtle and you don't think about them at all when you you watch the movie. Her outfits just are magical. But I think what's even more fascinating is how her dresses reflect her character throughout the story. Now, how about something hot to drink? Yes, please. Your Majesty. 
When Edmund first meets the witch, she looks beautiful. In the books, he describes seeing her as a great lady, taller than any woman that Edmund had ever seen. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or paper or icing sugar. It was a beautiful face in other respects, but proud and cold and stern. Like the books, Jadis is not immediately terrifying. There is an ethereal beauty about her that entrances Edmund. So her first look is soft. The dress is a gentle white that fades to an ice blue. Her fur cloak is cozy and warm. Like the book, her skin is pale and almost gray. She lacks any warm glow in the cheeks or nose that you might get in the snow. Her eyelashes have flecks of dainty snowflakes. Her hair is gathered in a soft style and her crown is tall and stately. On anyone else, this might be the look of a snow angel, not a witch. And that's exactly what Edmund thinks. Also at this point, Jadis doesn't know there is a threat to her in Narnia. She looks like the perfect sheet of ice and her power is at its height. When she learns Edmund is human, it takes all her might to not let her beautiful facade crack. She offers her cloak to warm him from the snow. She gives him hot chocolate and Turkish delight to build trust. She appeals to his greed and promises royalty if he brings his brothers and sisters. She even notices he doesn't think highly of them, so suggests they could be his servants. These acts, paired with her angelic look, persuade Edmund to view her positively. Even after Edmund learns she's a witch, his initial perception of her is so strong that in the books he says, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me. But these niceties are inauthentic acts of kindness. The prophecy says that human kids will lead to her downfall. She wants to get rid of them. Even in this first scene, her cruelty surfaces when she refuses to give Edmund more Turkish delight. This only shows more throughout the story and not just in personality. I'm glad this creature got to see some honesty before he dies. <laughs> Jadis's cruelty is represented by the furs she wears. In the beginning, we may have associated her fur with warmth and kindness, just like Edmund. But upon closer inspection, these furs don't hide the animals they are skinned from. Such brutality shows her disregard for life and her obsession with conquest. In the prequel book, Jadis explains how she fought with her sister for Charn's crown. But before her sister could win, Jadis spoke a curse that killed every creature except for herself, thus crowning her queen by default. She turned herself to stone only to be woken by two human children years later. One of the children asks her why she cursed everyone if the feud was just between her and her sister. Jadis replies, don't you understand? I was the queen. They were all my people. What else were they there for but to do my will? Jadis only sees people as tools for her own gain. She has no emotion and no care. This is exactly how she treats Edmund. The Turkish delight she so graciously offers him is enchanting to be addictive. When he comes to see her, because he's so obsessed to get more, she's furious that he came alone and almost kills him. She only keeps him alive because of the knowledge he has of his family's whereabouts and Aslan, the all-powerful lion that created Narnia and who is a threat to the witch's power. Her first fur wrap is made from white rabbits. Before, it was used to warm Edmund. Now, it is used to warm her throne, the only true thing she cares about protecting. Her cruelty of creatures is exemplified with her treatment of Mr. Tumnus. She injures him, starves him, and locks him in an ice prison as punishment for betrayal. She also reveals Edmund turned him in, although it was kind of unintentional, which shames Edmund and decreases Tumnus's hope. Then she turns him to stone, all because he decided to let a little girl live. On her throne room dress, her furs resemble an arctic fox. Later, when the Pevensies meet a fox claiming to help, they are distrustful. Foxes are sly and the witch has a secret wolf police. He claims he's on their side and that he just has an unfortunate family resemblance to evil. This clearly references him looking like the secret police, but it could also reference the queen herself. He too is later turned to stone for betrayal. At her war camp, Jadis wears the fur of badgers. Badgers are often seen as kind and friendly creatures. This only emphasizes her cruelty that she'd kill and relish wearing such innocent animals, similar to how she nonchalantly kills a butterfly, a simple, beautiful creature associated with spring. Although this is more personal because she's refusing to accept the end of her winter. Jadis rules with terror and fear. She tries to persuade Edmund to obey her by threatening him with her power. 
power. Even her own dwarf is terrified of her. When Edmund is recaptured by Aslan, the dwarf assumes she'll kill him. She doesn't, only because she can still use him. Even those loyal to her are viewed as functional objects and not beings. Animals are viewed as furs, not living things. Her fear philosophy is also represented by her war camp. The camp of the White Witch is dirty and dark. Aslan, who rules with love, has a camp that is warm and bright. At Aslan's execution, her dress is adorned with a black rooster. The entire animal, rather than just say, the feathers, is symbolic of the kill she's about to make. These animals, the rabbit, the fox, the badger and the bird are also references to a line in the book. Peter, upon arriving at the professor's countryside home, where the wardrobe lives, says, you might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along and the woods? There might be eagles. Badgers, said Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. Each animal is representative of the kids' personality. Eagles are brave like Peter. Badgers are friendly like Lucy. Foxes are tricksters like Edmund. And rabbits are sweet like Susan. Jadis wearing similar furs and animals is a callback to the book and representative of how she wants the Pevensey children dead. When Jadis goes to battle, she wears Aslan's mane. She unceremoniously shaved it before his execution. Shaving his hair is a form of mocking and humiliation. She couldn't just kill him, she had to make him suffer. Without his mane, he looks small, less grand, and less powerful, and she revels in it. You are giving me your life and saving no one. <laughs> so much for love. Jadis craves power. The silhouettes and color of her dress reflect how much power she has. Back in Charn, Jadis was willing to kill everyone, even her own family and the innocent, just to be queen, even if it meant ruling over the dead. When she's awakened by the children, she realizes her world is dying and demands to be taken to Earth so she can take over that world instead. Obviously, that doesn't happen, but she eventually lands in Narnia, and her goal becomes to obtain power there. When Edmund meets her, her dress is pure white and has a decently full skirt, but at her castle, where she shows her true colors and power, her dress balloons in volume. Even the shoulders explode in size. The color is now a sickly gray off-white, much more characteristic of her personality. The dress is also a direct reflection of her castle, grand, powerful, and unmissable. Her hair becomes severely and unnaturally pulled back, very different than the soft, flowy style in the beginning. As Jadis fails to capture the other three Pevensey children and spring arrives, her dress begins to physically melt. The silhouette shrinks in size and the color becomes a dark gray. If you notice, her crown is made of icicles that grow out of her head. They progressively melt as she loses power. When Jadis meets Aslan to discuss her ownership over Edmund, she wears a massive white gown again. Traitors belong to her, as is written in magic law, so she has significant leverage that even even Aslan cannot deny. This dress signals Jadis reclaiming her throne and power. But even with the law on her side, Aslan still maintains control. He offers himself in place of Edmund, saving his life. Jadis questions if he'll keep his promise, and his roar silences her and makes her sit down out of fear. Her dress may be a statement, but her crown is just barely peeking out of her hair, showcasing how much power she really has. Her dress during his execution is the darkest it gets. It is hard to see, but it's a deep blue, reminiscent of Aslan's cold death. She's finally getting what she wants. After all, once Aslan dies, there is a nothing stopping her from killing the Pevensies afterwards. Jadis wearing Aslan's mane to war also symbolizes the success of her conquest and rejuvenation of her status. With Aslan gone, the only being more powerful than her, she's sure to hold her crown, and she's making sure everyone knows it. Their leader wasn't so mighty after all. Jadis' final dress is her war dress. Along with Aslan's mane, which gives a wild look to her, her dress is made of thick chainmail. She also no longer has a crown, but wears a golden antler-like headpiece. Her hair is untamed, no longer resembling earthy roots. Her makeup includes warlike paint. This is her harshest, most brutal outfit. Although, even in her earlier outfits, 
Jadis is always lethal. Her ice wand is her source of power and doubles as a weapon. Now, since she's slain Aslan, there's nothing standing in her path to victory. This outfit, the pure war and violence that it references, is her ultimate demise. Even though Jadis thinks she's winning, the land is still spring-like. It's a subtle clue that she hasn't won yet. Aslan eventually kills her in battle, after her wand is destroyed by Edmund and she duels with Peter. Jadis's hunger for power and lack of regard for life blinded her to the true meaning of the magic law. Aslan is resurrected because he is innocent and nobly sacrificed himself for Edmund's wrongdoing. Jadis could have known this would happen if she interpreted the magic correctly, but she couldn't fathom love winning over her power. Unfortunately for her, the prophecy is fulfilled. The four children rule Narnia in place of the White Witch. This story is a religious allegory, but most simply, it's a story where good trumps evil and mistakes can be forgiven and bad actions can be redeemed, as long as you're not as cold-hearted as a witch. I love that she wears a dress here and not typical battle armor. Even though it might not be practical, it doesn't really matter to me because she's a magical character and I can believe that Jadis would make this work on the battlefields. Another interesting fact about Jadis, if you haven't read the books, is that she is actually the reason for the lamppost. The children that awaken her from her stone sleep accidentally bring her back to Earth. She wreaks some havoc there, because remember she wants to take over Earth, including tearing off a crossbar from a lamppost, and then they are whisked away again. Don't ask me how this happens, it involves some magical rings made by a magician uncle. They all arrive in Narnia just as Aslan is creating it. The witch hurls the crossbar at Aslan, which does no harm, and then the bar plants itself in the ground and it grows into a lamppost while the world is forming. This whole ordeal is why the prophecy is written for human children to defeat Jadis years later. Since human children brought evil into Narnia, they will have to help heal it. There is some other stuff that happens, but now you know some of the backstory of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Don't ask me about the other books though, because I only read the first three or four, and I also haven't seen any of the other movies. So this is where my knowledge ends. I would love to know what other fantasy costumes do you like? I have one more holiday wintry video coming out, so subscribe for that. I hope you have a magical night. Thank you so much for watching.